David, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so uh, you're you said you're in Santa Monica today, right? Yeah, Santa Monica and uh, Palm Springs, California. We we split uh, between the two cities during during the pandemic. Cool. I have a feeling that uh, you have good weather in in both of those locations. It is very warm. Uh, yeah. I do not know what the the Celsius uh, conversion is, but it's like it gets up to to ninety Fahrenheit here. Cool. That is awesome. Uh, well, David, really excited to have you on the show. Uh, you've had uh, a career in leadership that spans a bunch of different companies, uh, HTC, um, Black Pixel, One Medical, and today you're Director of Product Design at Webflow, uh, one of the companies that we really like. And of course, we had Vlad on the show as well. Um, but what I wanted to start with was, you know, of of all of these different companies that that you've been at, um, is there a person that you've reported to in your journey or manager uh, that was memorable in some way that you'd want to talk about? Now, it could be a good memory. It could be a bad memory. Uh, just any memorable boss. Yeah. Uh, first and for- foremost, uh, so many memories with with each person who's been my manager and it's really hard to pick one. It's like asking me, like, who's your favorite designer on your team, right? Like, there's there's so many facets and so many reasons that 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 make uh, those relationships memorable. If I had to pick one, the person who comes to mind to me is uh, Kimber Lockhart. She is the CTO of One Medical. She was the person that hired me. Some of the reasons that made it memorable is because I think she was the first leader I've had as a manager who really got me thinking about holistic product development, like engineering, product, and design. I wasn't just seen as a design manager, but a uh, contributor to her leadership team. And I think I learned a lot around cross-functional leadership, uh, really thinking about your executive presence and, and just your leadership, like philosophy in general. I think you know, in many other roles, it was kind of focused on like, you know, managing and overseeing things. And I think I really felt she helped activate and help me kind of emerge as a leader and think about my style. So though many awesome managers um, in in my time past and present, uh, Kimber is one who, who really stands out to me. Oh, that's super interesting. I'd love to dive into that a bit more, just get more tactical. What are some things that she explicitly did? Yeah, she's a very good coach. So I think she has a great balance of giving direction while giving you that that leeway to experiment, to, to make mistakes. So I think she really valued like developing people in that way. Uh, we kind of had this running joke where we call it Kimber Jiu-Jitsu because in a lot of one-on-ones with her, you know, I would kind of ask for advice and she'd kind of like throw it back to me and we kind of solved it together. So I think, you know, from, from being managed by her, I think she's such a tremendous coach and advisor in letting people kind of figure out a, their own style and B, their own approach to doing it. So like that was, uh, that was phenomenal. Yeah, that's super interesting. I, I like that term Kimber Jiu Jitsu. So <laughs> that's when you ask a question and uh, I guess she turned it around and, and got you to answer your own question. Yep, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and I think she's such a like well-rounded person too. She went to school as an engineer, of course, uh, a Stanford dropout, as as many people in Silicon Valley need uh, one Stanford dropout in their <laughs> their teams. Uh, but then she also really focused on like entrepreneurship and and really growth of the business. So I think again, it was just something where I think that's the moment. Like being managed by by her kind of took my lens from management and kind of really focused on leadership and really really explored what that meant. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, uh, do you find that uh, some of the lessons that you learned in, say, reporting to her, were those things that you kind of just realized at the time while being on her team? Or were these things that you, you know, looking back are now realizing, wow, that was actually the way that she did that was was really, really good? 
Yeah, I think some things you you recognized in the, in the midst of it and in the time it's happening. I, I think though, the majority of the time, it's when you look back. You look back and you realize like the things that your manager did. Maybe there were things I didn't agree with that I thought, you know, was not kind of where I wanted to go or, you know, or in the time it, it looks a lot different than it does years later. So I think that's something that I try to remind myself with people on my team is that like, you know, this could look different years from now. So like, you know, sometimes you don't want to get too caught up in, in the day to day, because yeah, I think when it's all said and done, you kind of look back and, and reflect on how you grew and how you achieved. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be immediate either. So I would say the majority of the time, it feels more like that, but that, but yeah, there were definitely some things I, when I observed her, were in a meeting with her, I could see it like right there, that moment. It's like, wow, this is like a really good leader. And then there are other things that years down the road, it's like, oh, now, now I understand this lesson or this decision after kind of experiencing it on my own, you know, through my, through the similar perspective that she had. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting, right? Like sometimes when you're leading a team, you might do something that is unpopular and hope that many years later, uh, that people will realize that, you know, the rationale behind taking a certain approach. That's right. Or even you hope yourself that many years later, like, I, I hope this is the right call. You know, it's like, you don't have, you know, I think leaders, you have to make the best decision you can at the time too. So sometimes, you know, the look back is full of like learning and, and maybe it's uh, full of regret too. So it's, uh, yeah, it's hard. You can't, you can't be certain. You just want to try your best. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So, David, you mentioned the the word regret, and uh, I know one of the things that I really wanted to chat with you about were uh, was early management mistakes. So, mm -hmm. I wanted to start by saying, when was the first time that you led a team, and what were some of the things that you did that uh, say that you learned not to do uh, after uh, being a manager for a while? Yeah. Um I think, you know, at HCC and Black Pixel, I was in a lead role that was more of a player coach in, in that regard. So I think, you know, one medical was one of the times where I, I started there as an individual contributor and, um, and didn't think I wanted to go back into management or being responsible for other people, but the, the opportunity came up. So I think, you know, the mistake I made uh, early in my management career and I think it, it catches some people off guard when I say this, so I want to preface it, is that I think sometimes uh, we as managers focus too much on making people happy and making your team members happy. And I am not saying that you shouldn't make your team members happy and support them. That's absolutely important. And it's one of the great signs of someone who's like really a really good candidate for leadership is they care about people, right? But I think what happens is sometimes you over-index on making people happy. And there are times where you, you have to make a call that someone's not going to be happy. Multiple people might not be happy in that regard. And really the learning for me is that like your responsibility is to manage and lead the entire team. So you need to kind of figure out those moments of, like, how do I balance the, the, the greater decision for the team, the company, and you want to balance the happiness of individuals. But I think sometimes I, early in my career, got caught in trying to make everyone happy and really make their situations the most ideal as possible, where it could come into conflict with, like, what we need to do or conflict with other people's happiness as well. So I would say that's the number one mistake because you want to support people and you want to be happy, make them happy, but you also don't want to go so far where it puts the other things you're responsible for, such as like uh, design strategy or such as like some of the operational components. Uh, you know, you don't want to compromise that. Yeah. Is there a story or an example that you remember or, you know, the moment where you realize that, hey, I may be over indexing on happiness a little bit? Yeah, I think the thing, I think the hardest thing as a manager is balancing uh, career development conversations. 
like anywhere you go, you know, I think that's, that's the top challenge because it's something that, that really affects people in, in so many ways. So I think, you know, early on, I really learned that you have to be mindful of like being able to give that direct feedback. Uh, I, I mentioned in a previous uh, manager chat at fellow just that, you know, you don't want people to be surprised in um, performance management and, and career leveling. And I think, especially the last two places I've been with one medical and Webflow, they've both kind of experienced this hyper growth, meaning that it's, it's grown pretty fast within like, you know, set amount of time. And I think what's important is to balance like, you know, career development for people and also what's needed for that said growth too. So I think, you know, early on mistakes might have been like just really trying to get people there to that while not, while needing to remember that you need to balance like, you know, where, where the team is going to go in that regard too. So I think that's probably one of the hardest conversations to have is, uh, you know, talking about where people are in, in their career growth, um, you know, what they need to do and also kind of like where the company is going and growing to as well. I think that sort of, career navigation in a growing, uh, growing company can, can, can be challenging because the, the needs constantly change. And I think that, you know, those are some things that come to mind is like, you know, re really being clear with people and, you know, and you might have to say things that people aren't going to be happy about. So you don't want to over index on, on their happiness there if it's, if things aren't true. Yeah. So, so that's really interesting. So I guess, um, do I have it, uh, correct that. So when you're saying that uh, companies in hyper growth stage, uh, there's this concept of, you know, if you're in hyper growth, uh, then the assumption is that, you know, either everybody on the team also grows at the rate of the company, or the company grows faster than they do. And, um, and, and I think like, you're, you're basically referring to just being able to cl clearly sort of articulate that. And if, if someone's not ready um, for that next stage, or they haven't been able to keep up with the growth that just having those sorts of tough conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that hap that happens at every startup, right? You know, you go from that stage of finding product market fit and really just having people who, you know, are there and can do anything and everything. And then all of a sudden, like now, as you kind of embark on this growth, you need to bring in people with experience and, and there's certain layers of it that have now changed. Right. So like the, the need of the company has kind of mutated and changed, you know, in addition. So I think a lot of times, um, you know, I felt this before in my career, right. It's just thinking like, okay, well, I've been here, uh, we're growing, so I should be this next person in line for this. Right. But it turns out like this whole, you know, level, uh, that that's needed is completely different for the phase of the company. So I'm curious. So you, you mentioned that you, you've experienced that, um, yourself personally. Um, what is a way that you would recommend that people have that kind of conversation? Because I think like part of the problem is that, um, until you've seen it, until you've seen, say what someone operating at the next level can sort of, um, look like, it's kind of hard to, you know, rationalize like why it wouldn't be you to take that position as an example. Yeah, it's hard, right? Because I think the moment someone comes in as your peer or let's say above you, you're automatically thinking that this person is impeding on your growth because they're they're literally in that position that that you want to be in, right? And and I think what actually happens a lot of times is the person's going to accelerate your growth in a lot of ways, because they know what good looks like. And it's not to say that like what you don't do, what you're doing isn't good. Maybe it's like they, they show what excellence looks like, right? That repeated uh, excellence of, you know, running a team or being able to hire and, and, and onboard people, you know, quickly and effectively. So I think that's something you're right. If, if you haven't experienced it before, it can feel really scary because it, all of a sudden it feels like someone's in here, like taking the role that you wanted 
And, you know, and I think the advice I'd give people is like, um, you know, what's most important is the outcomes that you experience at the, at the companies, right? So like, uh, you know, there, there are going to be opportunities later on, whether within the company or as you continue to progress in your career, no one's going to stay in the same place forever. It's very, it's very rare, right? People move on. So it's just really thinking about like, what sort of experience you're going to gain from that because it happens so much in startups and companies that are starting to grow. It's like all of a sudden there's all these leaders and senior leaders coming in. And I think that's the, like the number one piece of advice I would tell people is that like the likelihood is someone's going to like help level you up and help you grow a lot quicker versus it being like this person is now like a blockade from your career development. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. So speaking of uh, career development itself, um, I know one of the things that you've thought a lot about is career development for people who are people leaders. Um, you know, obviously, it's, it's a decision that people need to make, uh, which is like, do I want to be a people leader? Uh, so there's that. But then once you become a people leader, there's there's also different types of people leaders and different levels. And each one means different things. Uh, so I'd love for you to maybe elaborate or, or just talk about, you know, s- some, of, some of your thoughts uh, on that. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is like, how do you, how do you even know that you want to become a people leader? And I, I say more often than not, people they just start doing it in a lot of ways. So I think the best people leaders are the ones who, you know, have kind of really focused on mentorship, really uh, focusing on cross-functional alignment. They've already doing, they're starting to lead already. The thing that I tell people a lot of times too, is that um, there is this myth that people leaders are the most important, uh, you know, role on the team. And that's absolutely not true because I think um, when you think about impact, uh, like I think about principal designers I've had on my team or have had staff product designers who like they're actually doing the work, you know, and they're actually leading in a lot of ways. So I I think people leaders kind of this, it's a specific type of role, right? And it's a role that serves serves others and it's 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 a different type of impact because i remember my first week as a people manager i felt like i didn't do anything right because i'm no longer designing i'm no longer doing this i'm like i just went to a bunch of meetings like what did i even do you know this whole week so i think that's the first part is making sure like why you want to become a people leader and and are you going to get fulfillment out of it too i think a lot of people in management roles maybe got forced into it. So startup that's growing or opportunity that came up. And I think one thing we often feel is that uh, I think people feel they have to take the opportunity and you, and you don't necessarily. So going back to the other part of the question, which is kind of the the different types of roles for, uh, for management and leaders, I think it's important to know like where you feel you're going to have the most impact too, because I think, when you talk to uh, design managers or you talk to people where they want to grow in their career, they all say like, I want to be a VP of design or I want to be a chief design officer. And it's like, I understand why people might want that because, you know, when you look at the career ladder, you're going to look at the very top, right? And the most motivated people might say like, whatever's at the very top, I'm going to climb that mountain and I want to go there. And I think it's important to recognize like where your skills and interests um, really align with the type of roles. So I'll give you an example is, um, you know, I, I'm in a director role now. So the majority of my time, I've been uh, managing managers. And it's, and managing managers is different than managing designers directly. So there was a moment uh, for the last few, um, for the last few months, I've been managing some of the brand designers directly uh, we've hired an amazing uh, director of brand design who starts this week, actually. So really excited for her to start. But um, if I'm completely candid with you, I don't think I was ever the best like direct line manager, like with individual contributors, because for me, 
I feel like my skills are more focused on coaching, more on high level strategy, recruiting and hiring. And then when it comes to kind of help like coordinate some of the work, I think I can get by, but it's not like my, my greatest skill. And then I've worked with um, design managers where they're excellent at that. Like that's like where they belong in, and, and, and they find the most joy out of that. So it's really important for us as like design managers and leaders to identify like, okay, what are the different levels and roles of management that I really find gratitude from? Because, you know, I've, I've never been a VP of design. I don't know if it's something I can say that like, yes, that's the type of, you know, work I want to be doing every day. Like there's probably some things I want from that, but is there things where, you know, the role director is more interesting the same way for some people with the role of like directly managing individual contributors and really being a lot closer to the work might find them a lot of joy. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. So I, I'm going to challenge you on that just a little bit, which is yeah. how would you have known that you would have liked being a design director as much as you do if you had not yeah. <laughs> basically gotten there? <laughs> So how yeah. do you know, for example, that you won't love being a VP or, or a chief design officer afterwards? I guess one part is you don't, right? And you have to, you know, know that you kind of have to experience it too. But then I think, you know, if you go to another place later on, you might, you might have that realization that you want to get closer to the work a bit. But I think one thing I really recommend with people is like, when you think about mentorship and people you can talk to, like find mentors who are at that next level. So you can hear from their experience, what that's like. Yeah. You know? But I think, you know, if there is a case where you, yeah, you, part of it is you do have to get into that, that role to, to know what it's like. And I think, you know, one thing that I share with people, it's like, you know, really do ask yourself like what aspects of it makes you happy, you know, because it is something where, uh, you know, it's not like each role is not just like a more senior version of it. It's, it's a different, it's, it's a different role, different responsibilities that you need to focus on. So, you know, for example, like I meet with the IC designers every other month. So I, I try to, I want to foster like a close relationship with them, but it's a different cadence than having weekly one-on-ones with them with, you know, as as they would with their direct line manager. So it's 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 a different type of relationship in the organization that you have to think about. And as a VP or like a chief design officer, that relationship likely is going to be even further more removed, you know, in in that regard. So, you know, it's just really thinking about the things that that bring you that joy and make sure that, you know, you you have time to be doing that. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. And I think like one of the things that you said is, is being on, which is uh, you basically have to talk to people who are already in that role. It reminds me of this, uh, this great book called Stumbling uh, Upon Happiness. I don't know if you've read it, but it's, uh, it's one of those things, which is like humans are incredibly bad at predicting how happy they will be under you know certain circumstances. And the only way it turns out, or the best way it turns out that you can actually uh, figure out how happy you will be or how you will perceive that is by talking to someone who's experiencing it at that moment, not a lot later, but like who's experiencing it right then and there. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting thing. So uh, do I take it that, uh, so do you have mentors that, that you talk to today about you know, your growth or like how do you invest in your own growth? Yeah, I... Um... I have a couple of mentors and the thing that, that I feel and, and often share with people is that your mentor doesn't have to be one person. So you can have mentors who help you navigate certain things. So, you know, when I think about like innovation or really trying to focus on that, you know, I have a mentor who it, is an ex Apple engineer. And he and I really have a lot of conversations around that. I have other mentors who they've been VPs of design before. So you almost kind of form your own, like, like board of directors in a lot of ways where you have these group of mentors that you can reach out to 
and and update them and it's really good to to do that at like on a quarterly basis so um you know i treat i treat my career growth like running a company where you basically have like set your own like okrs and you and you you provide updates on a quarterly for people because i think your mentors love hearing from you and just kind of hear how you're doing and and how they can help too but i think that's one way i invest in my personal growth is like you know i I have, um, you know, current managers and current leaders that help me invest in my growth, but I think there's also um, value to have your own external mentors. So people who know you really well, and also people you've connected with to kind of help build your work on your blind spots and gaps. So you can like start thinking about your own career development. Cause I think for leaders, uh, we often don't have time to think about it because we're focus on the career growth of, of others and, and the work that we're doing. So it's, it's good to invest in time to step back and, and reflect. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. I've, you know, haven't heard it that way before, which is you're, you're almost mentioning your career growth. Like it, it's a company and you have OKRs and yeah. <laughs> uh uh, I mean, it, it sounds like you, it sounds like you take it very seriously, uh, which is awesome. Uh, I'm going to ask you something very tactical. Uh, yeah. How did you go about like getting these mentors um, and, you know, getting them um, to get bought in on, I guess, you, your growth or your OKR system or, or goals? Like, is that something like very explicitly that, that you asked, which is like, let's meet once a quarter and I'm going to report on this stuff or how does it work? Uh, tactically speaking. Yeah. I, the, I get asked this all the time and I, you know, I think, I think in life in general, uh, the best relationships like form organically. And, and for me, a lot of these conversations uh, with people who I consider my mentor today, it wasn't like I sent a cold email and was like, hey, would you be my mentor? You know, but I think it, came, it, it did come from cold emails because it was something where, you know, I realized like this person can help me with these things. And I think the thing that's important is, you know, when you reach out to people, be respectful of their time. And, you know, and I always try to preface that's like, you know, just appreciate their time even reading the email and I don't expect any answers back. And I think the other thing is then having a clear ask of what you're looking for, right? So, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I try not, I try to be as specific as possible. Like, don't say like, Hey, could we get coffee sometime? Or could we do a zoom? Like these people are so busy, but you could be like, Hey, I'm trying to focus on like getting better at recruiting or hiring, or I'm hiring for this role. And was wondering if, you know, I could get some advice from that. And I think when you're more specific, people are more inclined to, to reply back. And then I think from that, there's like follow-ups and and times that I'll continue to just basically continue the conversation right so I think like a great mentor uh, relationship is when the 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 conversation like organically continues yeah I, I love that concept of just being very very specific and it sounds like you've thought about this because it's uh you you recognize like different people are good at different things. And so you, you probably go to different mentors for different things that, that you want to get better at. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny too, because I think like, it sounds like my system is very extravagant and, and complex, but it's pretty simple. It's like a, you know, it's like a markdown file with like, okay, this one I want to try and achieve this quarter. So it's just like making sure like, you have growth indicators for yourself, but yeah, I think when there are certain people that I'll seek out for, for, for specific things, because I know they're either really known for that or like, I know can really help me in, in, in that area. And, and, you know, there may be some mentors who are more generalist too, like the same way there's various shapes of designers. Uh, you might be able to have a mentor who is, is good at a lot of things and, and you could go to one person. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that's super helpful. Um, David, you you also have uh, speaking of like mentorship and uh, and teaching, you have your own newsletter uh, called Proof of Concept. 
And uh, you share a lot of things. Obviously, it's a, it's a design-oriented newsletter, uh, but also there's a lot of leadership and management advice, you know, baked in. And one of the concepts that you've talked about in in one of the, um, I guess, uh, in one of the letters was this concept of a leadership tree. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd love for you to talk about what is a leadership tree. Yeah. So. A leadership tree is inspired by, uh, it came from this concept in American football. Uh, There's this head coach named Bill Walsh, who is like a Hall of Fame coach for the San Francisco 49ers. So uh, has, you know, he has this great book called um, The Score Takes Care of Itself, which talks a lot about leadership and excellence. And, And he's the one, not he didn't coin this, but people coined it because of him called the Bill Walsh, Bill Walsh coaching tree. And that's kind of talking about like his protégés and people who've been part of his coaching staff who have now developed like their own, uh, their own like trees as well too. So yeah, if you, uh, if you search uh, Bill Walsh coaching tree, you'll see like a visualization of that. Um, I kind of did my own leadership tree in the ways like, um, I use it as like an inspiration and a reflection tool to kind of connect like who, who've been managers, you know, that I've really respected in the past, like Kimber, you know, like, and thinking about like, okay, what's that like greater part of this like leadership tree that I'm a part of. And I think one thing that helps me recognize is uh, being able to identify like people I can talk to and and connect with. And then the other thing I think that is a motivator for me, it's thinking about how do I, how do I start developing my own tree? Not in a selfish way, but in a way that like, you know, like how do I ensure people are growing? So, you know, I get asked a lot, how do I define success as a manager? And I think it goes beyond the current role you want to be invested in people's career so you know once in a while i kind of i map this tree out and i think about like okay these are people who used to be designers on my team you know have they grown as their own managers have they grown as their own directors or started their own companies whatever their career goal is like how are they doing with that so it's a nice like it's almost like a visual mood board that helps me kind of put that together and it helps me remind me that i'm I'm just a tiny speck in this whole like leadership group and, and, you know, whether it's like you're looking at upwards in terms of like the, the connections I've had or downwards with like, you know, downstream with like the people on my team, it helps me kind of think about like, okay, like how's this person doing? So I think, you know, for example, one of my, one of the designers, I, Got, had the pleasure of managing at, at one medical she's she was I hired her as a senior designer and she's a um she's a product design manager now so I think it's something that you know I it, it was like the best news I've heard all year just kind of hearing that that promotion happened even though I'm no longer there so I kind of update the tree in that way just to be like okay you know and these are the great leaders that are going to emerge from her leadership style too yeah, that's amazing. So do you, so you must keep in touch with, uh, with all the people that you, you've led in the past? The majority of them. Yeah. Cool. No, that, that, that's super awesome. And it, you know, it reminds me about something that you said earlier on in the conversation. Uh, and uh, I, I've certainly been there too, which is like, when you start, you know, when you first start managing a team, uh, one of the things that you might think about is like, oh, what did I actually get done this week? Uh, right. I was in meetings all week. <laughs> yeah. What did I actually do? Uh, but it, but it's actually interesting. It's, it's, it's something shifts, right? You, you're, you're almost more about the productivity of the, the team as a whole. Uh, and it sounds like what you're talking about now is also just the, the success and continued growth of the career of the, the people who have been on your team. Yeah, and I think one thing that I've learned is it sometimes takes years to see the outcomes as a as a leader. And I think, you know, when I was an individual contributor, it was so much more tangible and in a way that's like, hey, I did this design, we delivered it and we shipped it. And, you know, when 
it comes to management, you may be focusing on like, hey, I'm trying to like set this in motion and it could take quarters, it could take years for you to see that impact later on. Yeah, that, uh, that, that's very interesting. And so uh, in terms of conversations that you have with your team, like, do you, is this like uh, a thing that you do once a quarter, twice a year uh, to, to really like figure that out and invest in their growth? Or is it, you know, more frequent than that? We're trying to do more frequent. And I think it really should be, you know, it should be happening all the time. And I think sometimes when you're, you're growing so fast as a, as a startup. I think uh, one thing you need to remember is like focusing on and making sure there's enough attention with each person, right? Because if you go from a team of like 12 to 30, uh, some people might feel like left behind, right? Or maybe they're like the, the fifth team member and all of a sudden there's so much focus on hiring and, and, and bringing new people on. I think it's important to have this conversation. So I think that's something like we've been really wanting to work on at, 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 with my team at Webflow is just the feedback and recognition to make sure that we have that time to have those conversations on both their managers and, and, and myself too, uh, to do that. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, honestly, it's something we need to continue to, to improve on and make sure that we, we, we invest in it because, uh, of our ambitious goals, it's something it's hard to kind of, it, it, it could be easy to put aside because of like all the other things we need to get done. So, you know, we do try to do more, more rituals on a quarterly and monthly basis to make sure that, that we are covering that. Yeah, that makes sense. And so you, you mentioned the word recognition and there was this, this other topic that you also talk about uh, in one of your newsletters, which is uh, a hype doc. Uh, has a really cool name. What is it? So a hype doc is, um, um, as the name alludes to, it's a document for you to kind of capture these, these moments and wins. And it was something that uh, Sarah and Molly, uh, when I joined Webflow, two managers who uh, joined me at that same time uh, came up with. And, and I think it's not a it's not a resume, right? It's not a CV. I think it's making sure you capture those moments that, that are memorable and important. So for example, when, uh, when, when Preeti got promoted to product design manager at One Medical, it's not something I put on my resume, right? But it's something that I wanna remember to be like, you know, that's a great moment worth celebrating. Uh, though there are other managers who helped her get there, like I got to contribute to that. So it helps kind of bring like kind of context and, and moments that are important for you to remember throughout your career. Because I think often when you look back, um, even when you do like performance reviews, right? Uh, if you don't document things, Usually people, what they do with performance reviews, they'll, they'll look at their calendar, right? They're like, what meetings did I go to? What things did I do? And that's not necessarily impact. I think by having that hype doc, you're working on it together with your team members to make sure that, hey, we're, we're recognizing these moments. Uh, you know, and for some, some people, I think, uh, I think a lot of reactions you get is they're like, I completely forgot that I did this. This was a great moment to celebrate. So it's a great way to celebrate together. And it's also a great document to bring into your performance reviews to share, like, um, you know, remind each other, like, these, these are the moments to celebrate. But I think, yeah, um, I've only started this since I was at Webflow. So I'm finding myself retroactively trying to go back and say, like, okay, what were those memorable moments at, at One Medical or at Black Pixel? And, and like, those human moments, right? Like, maybe it's... Um, you know, that time I worked with a designer and really helped ship this, like this amazing outcome that we're really proud of or help help coach someone out of a hard situation. Like that's kind of all the things that go into the hype doc. So it's kind of like your highlight reel that's kind of focused on like more on the human perspective and more on the moments. Yeah, I love that. That's a super cool concept. And uh, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I totally agree that if you don't have rituals like this, yeah, uh, when it comes to performance review time, 
uh, you will be struggling. Yeah, so you're just, just going to have a you're just going to have a blank document, right? And and you don't want that. Yeah, that that's always that always hard. Uh, David, uh, we're just coming up on uh, time here, so I did want to ask you uh, two things. Um, one was for all the the people who uh, want to subscribe to your newsletter, how do they find it? Oh yeah, so it's called Proof of Concept. So the URL is David Hong, my name dot Substack dot com. Uh, I try to write on a weekly basis. And as you mentioned, like the topics vary. So it's, you know, sometimes it's more direct about here's a certain framework. Sometimes it's more abstract about conversations, but I think it's kind of general reflections of things that at times past and present that, that I like to write about. So I try to, um, I try to send it out every Sunday, every Sunday morning. And so far, I think I've done it for the last 29 weeks in a row. So just trying to build consistency there, but would, would definitely appreciate it if, you know, if people are interested to, to subscribe. Yeah, that, that's a good streak. You can't let it go now. Yeah, got to keep going. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the final question is, and, and, and we asked this from all of our guests, for all those managers and leaders looking to continue to get better at their craft of uh, leading teams, uh, what parting advice, tips or tricks or words of wisdom would you leave them with? Yeah, it's a great question. The number one thing I say to people, and this is the probably the biggest piece of advice I would give, is that your career is not this linear path. It's um, it's a journey and things can change. and and things sometimes happen in ways you don't expect it, both like maybe in a way that's disappointing, but also like exciting too, because if something happens and you don't get like a certain promotion or you don't get like, you know, the sort of incentive happen, it can open pathways to like other other places um, that you may not have known about, right? And I think this is kind of how we started the conversation where like, by going to one medical and like working with um kimber and also wes who was my other manager uh during during my four years there you know it kind of unlocked this path of like oh like i want to focus on like product development leadership not just like not just design in, in that way so sometimes like the paths the path looks different than uh than you might think so i think sometimes people try to kind of map out like this is my exact 10 year plan. I think what's important is mapping out some of the outcomes you want to achieve or the things you'd really be proud of. And it's recognizing it along the way as you're kind of going through it. And then as far as resources, I think um, I always recommend the book, The, the Leadership Pipeline. Oh, I haven't and read that. And it's, it's a great one. I think it's a little bit older these days, but it's it's a great book kind of talking about these different levels of management leadership and you know from that uh you know seek out seek out mentors and i think for me it's like seeking out like people who are doing it it's probably the best resource so you know i think if you have a clear intention and and you value people's time they're they're likely going to respond or or connect you to others so that that'd be kind of my recommendation it's like one like really mapping out the outcomes and what you want to achieve in your career versus like the exact steps to it and then like start start reflecting you know every so often it's like what are you doing to continue to start kind of building towards that path now and you might be surprised that in your current job or something you do on the side as a passion project that you're building up those skills and those experiences to get you there like already right now yeah and uh that's a great place to end it uh david thanks for doing this yeah thank you so much for having me